thank you for holding this hearing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the chair of the full committee, Chair Rogers, for five minutes for an opening statement. Today's hearing is the beginning of our legislative process to make sure the federal government is prepared to handle any public health hazard threatening Americans' safety and well-being, whether it's chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, a cyber attack, or another emerging infectious disease like influenza or COVID-19. We need to be prepared for all types of hazards, whether the cause is deliberate, accidental, or natural. We're evaluating existing programs and authorities originally created under the Pandemic and All Hazard Preparedness Act, which will expire on September 30th, 2023. Our goal is to ensure America is prepared for and ready to respond to any public health security threat. I want to join in thanking Representative Hudson and Representative Eshoo for leading the request for information process and the eventual legislation related to this topic today. Today's hearing is an opportunity to review the Administration for Strategic Pre Pre Preparedness and Response, or ASPR. ASPR was established in 2006 to serve as a lead agency for our nation's preparedness and response. While the agency and its leadership have been tested over the past two decades, no prior threat amounted to the scope or magnitude of COVID-19. In some ways, ASPR stepped up, and in other ways, the response could be improved. ASPR's authorities expire this year, and that requires us to review and examine ASPR's role in the preparedness and the response framework, as well as how ASPR should be viewed and operationalized moving forward. During COVID-19, especially in the early days, we witnessed Herculean efforts in so many of our communities, remarkable stories of Americans, goodwill, resilience, and people coming together during at times of incredible stress and fear of the unknown. And these efforts inform what ASPR should be focused on in an emergency, facilitating, coordinating, and supporting innovation and, innovate, and an initiative, an initiative by private sector, local, and state actors. But we've heard a number of concerns about how ASPR is going about this mission. Questions around leadership and communication, questions about use of funding and transparency, questions about management of the strategic national stockpile, and generally questions about whether the, whether the agency created to be our nation's lead on preparedness and response was actually able to lead effectively. We all heard from hospitals and healthcare providers across the country who struggled to find masks, test kits, and other supplies. I heard from Americans who offered their ideas and services to BARDA to no avail. There's a lack of transparency and communication to medical stakeholders from this agency that has been tasked with developing and maintaining public-private partnerships. Questions continue to arise around ESPER's next steps. What is ASPR's role moving forward? How should this agency be defined? How will it operate? both during and outside of public health emergencies. And that's what we're here to discuss today. I look forward to hearing from Ms. O'Connell on specific gaps exposed by the response to COVID-19 and how to address them for any type of future public health hazard. I hope better interaction and coordination with the private sector is at the top of the list as ASPR's early COVID response was one crisis after another. In addition to the critical role of ASPR, CDC also plays a role in our preparedness and response framework. I recognize the administration has several requests for new authorities and programs before us today. Before considering any of these requests, this committee has several requests and questions of our own regarding decisions made during the COVID-19 pandemic. Much more has to be done to build back public trust. Finally, as we saw demonstrated through Operation Warp Speed, FDA plays a role of granting emergency use authorizations to respond to emerging inf infectious diseases or other threats like smallpox or anthrax. This committee has broad jurisdiction over public health, and we're working on multiple fronts to rebuild trust in public health. In addition to today's work on preparedness, for example, our oversight subcommittee is looking at NIH's continued funding of risky research grant programs. 
Dr. Miller Meeks is leading an effort to look at CDC reform. There is plenty of concern with FDA regarding baby formula shortages, drug shortages, and the lack of therapeutics ap approved to treat severe cases of COVID-19, just to name a few. And with the Biden administration finally ending the COVID-19 public health emergency, and with, and with President Biden ending critical Title 42 border protections, there remain questions about transitioning out of the pandemic and managing the surge of migrants coming to our country. To start, the House should pass Rep. Lesko's bill that would help address the illicit fentanyl crisis at our border. All our work on these fronts is important for the health and the American people and to hold government accountable. That work will continue, but the focus today in particular is on preparedness and response authority so that we can be better equipped for the immediate response. It's critical that we work together so that the American people are, are prepared for the next threat that may come. And I look forward to a productive hearing. I yield back. Thank you. The chair yields back and the chair.